Okay, the time is now 7.30, and I'd like to call our Downers Grove Public Library Board of uh, Library Trustees monthly meeting to order. Caitlin, could you proceed with the roll call, please? Yes, Trustee Doherty, Trustee Humphreys is not here this evening. Um, Trustee Kutia, here. Trustee Stapleton, here. President Greenberg. Here, thank you very much. We're now on to agenda item number three, the welcome to the visitors. Thank you very much for your interest in the library. And in just a few minutes, there'll be an opportunity to, to speak. Um, we're now on to agenda item number four, approval of minutes. Did anyone have any questions or comments regarding, <coughs> regarding last month's minutes? Now, I will motion to approve the minutes from the November meeting of 2019. Okay, we have a second. Okay, we have a motion to approve last month's minutes for the November 13, 2019 minutes. It has been seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Okay, the minutes have been approved. Thank you very much. We're on, now on to agenda item number five, financial matters. Julie, do you want to tell us how we're doing, or how we did? <laughs> you have probably the most lengthy financial matters possible, because we not only have the um, end of November financial report and the end of December financial report, we also have the December invoices to ratify and the January invoices to ratify. You also have the um, the beginning of the 2020 fiscal year, um, as well as the unaudited end of 2019 fiscal year. So there are an awful lot of pages to this. Um, I think the you know November that's so last month. Um, so. For December, you will see that in the unaudited end of the fiscal year, we were at 102% for revenue. Um, and in the capital replacement fund, we were only at 93% expended. And that was even including the additional lighting project that we did um, uh, over and above what we had originally planned because we came in so far under budget with the contract for um, the HVAC project. In addition, we are still anticipating um, more rebates on that. So even though we're showing uh, $42,000 under budget in that for 2019, we should actually realize um, we should be more like 60, 65 thousand once all those rebates come in so we're really excited about the fact that we came in so far under budget and then for the 2019 end of December we're at 93.8 percent in expenditures that is still not final we do still have some things um, that will be moved and then of course with the audit it will all vary just a teensy bit uh, you will get your end of the year financials that are definite in the February packet. And then, let's see, for January, you have both 2019 and 2020 invoices um, because some are charged to the 2019 fiscal year and some are charged to the 2020 fiscal year. And then if you look on Um, in the January invoices of note for the 2020 fiscal year, you will see that we have both the Archer, Arthur J. Gallagher Risk Management, which is a premium renewal at $10,360, and then the Libraries of Illinois Risk Agency Insurance Policies for 2020 at $35,068. That is the workers' comp premium, and the full package liability um, with the Libraries of Illinois Risk Agency. Uh, we are in our third year of participation with Lira, so beginning in November, the renewals will each come to the board. Um, those renewals were not coming to you for approval because with the initial um, membership um, agreement with the Lira pool, you commit to three years. 
which is an escape door off the staff uh, hallway coming down from the second floor from the stairwell to the egress stairwell. Um, just over time, the, the salt from the snow removal and everything else, you know, with those steel doors, it's just, it's taken its toll on it. Um, unfortunately, it is rusting out. So that one and the one right next to it um, are both going to be replaced. Um, the alternate that we did not accept that we were toying with the idea of adding um, a escape door out of the administration office going through the PR department, um, that is one thing that we've decided not to do. Um, there's going to be a slight change uh, to, to the project. Um, we're also, with along with getting the exterior repainted, we're also going to be doing the, the under soffits that are at the north entrance and the south entrance. Um, I got an add-on of 4000 from the painter for that. We're just going to take that deduction from the contingency. Um, and we kind of ballooned out the, the, the safety um, fencing and stuff like that. I don't think it's going to hit that mark at 50000 um, My gut feeling is it's going to be somewhere around twenty. Um, but Jason and I still need to get with the village because they did have some stipulations on some things, so we're just trying to come to a come to an even ground on and, and settle on what we can go ahead and do. Um, I we're not going to hit the number that you see. Um, we're definitely going to be lower than that, but we did kind of blow things out just in case. Um, you know, as we start doing the project, if something unforeseen comes up that we're not ready for. Okay. But the alternate one that we're not accepting is the painting of the door we decided yes. not to do. Yeah. Okay. Could, yeah. So I trust that if you close up that one door that says do not exit the children's room, you have to code. Is yes. there some other it's thing? Not, it's, it's not, not a, actually a door no. anymore. It hasn't been a door since <laughs> It hasn't been a door yeah. okay. <laughs> It's a wall on the other side, but on the exterior of the building, there is still, still a steel the door, door that says no exit. <laughs> <laughs> There's just wall on the other side. Yeah. 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 Should there be an well, I was just wondering, yeah, why that door had originally been there, like, for some safety code. Is there some other exit? Yes, there is. There, there's the egress door that's no more than 50 feet away from there. What is egress? Uh, exit door. Oh. <laughs> and the <laughs> configuration of the children's department changed completely in 2014. And so this was an exit door that was there prior to 2014 and that reconfiguration. And when they redid the, the children's department, they did not need an egress door there. And it's actually uh, the kids' program room and they didn't want the extra door in there. My thoughts were to save it and use it on the other location, but um, unfortunately the same thing has happened with that one. It's just weather's taking its toll on it. Well, we could start some art project with the three. We could get something more. Right. <laughs> we saw like the cows in Chicago yeah. and the little dogs, and now it's going to be like the doors of Downers Grove Library. <laughs> just randomly placed around. <laughs>
little alcohol and drug free workplace policy anymore um, with the legalization of recreational cannabis. Um, the recommendation from HR source has been updated. Um, they are human resource management um, company that, that gives us lots of good advice on lots of policies. Uh, and this policy is actually based on their sample. Um, tailored to our situation. <coughs> Pretty straightforward. Um, one of the main changes is allowing for uh, testing for alcohol and drugs in cases of reasonable suspicion and all of the policy points that need to be included for that. I had one, it's sort of like one comment, I guess, who wants sure. a couple of revisions. Um, uh, I guess it's the, when we look at the actual policy, 3.40.1, the first, second, third paragraph down, the, um, in the second to last sentence, it says, this is really getting to like, I think like the HIPAA issues and stuff like that. It says, employees should not, however, disclose underlying medical conditions unless specifically directed to do so. And this was just me, I think, kind of obsessing over like a situation where someone from the library, like Julie, you direct somebody to give you information that really isn't consistent with like the law. And so, not that that would ever happen, but the, the way that I would change this, and I'll just read this slowly, Caitlin, and then you can tell me if this, I was just trying to get to the point where even if someone is directed to provide like, a, a, you know, information regarding a medical issue, they don't have to provide that if that direction is not in accordance with applicable law. So this is the way that I had it written. Uh, the second to last sentence. Employees shall not be required to disclose underlying medical conditions unless the direction to disclose the underlying medical condition is consistent with applicable law. It's in the third paragraph down. The second to last sentence. Yeah. Okay, can you read back that whole yes. sentence? Employees should not. I can read my own handwriting. Employees should not be required to disclose underlying medical conditions unless the direction to disclose the underlying medical conditions is consistent with the law. Let me read it again. I think there are like a couple okay. little, just a couple little. Points. Yep. I know one is the should versus shall. Oh, right. I did admit. Yes. Okay. Employees shall not be required to disclose underlying medical conditions unless, no, I've got to read my writing, unless the request to disclose the underlying medical condition is consistent with applicable law. Got it. We've got the video to right. back you up if you need it. Yeah. Not that you would ever request anything that's not consistent with right. applicable law, but I just wanted to make sure. Very clear in the house. Yes, exactly. I think that was my own account. Why shall versus shall? I, I. Sounds fancy. Yeah, I think that's, <laughs> the, I think that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
allowed to consume alcohol at that point, right? So I mean, that's kind of nothing that's yes. assumed there. Yeah. There's so, there's so many scenarios that are difficult to sort of capture within like a policy too. Because I was thinking about like a legal drug that you react in a way that isn't, you know, consistent with what you would be, you know, how you normally react. But someone has a prescription drug that doesn't, you know, that is prescribed to them, that doesn't, you know, that causes them. Yeah, that they have a bad reaction. Yeah. So I think that we do the best we can with the policy, and then we rely on you to make good judgment calls. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of that 80-20 rule. They, what's the most likely scenario? Right. You know, 80% of the time, 95% of the time, you're going to apply this straightforward, exactly like it says. Mm -hmm. And then the rest is going to be the policy markets. Yeah. <laughs> Try to write a policy that covers everything. Right, this could be the 50 policy, pages. The, yeah, the this policy manual would be 50 pages. Mm -hmm. Longer each mm -hmm. section. Okay, does anybody have any other comments or questions to the updated, the proposed update to the personnel policy? I do have one question about it. It has to do with Someone's prescribed medical marijuana. It was had to do with reasonable suspicion. Uh, second paragraph says employees using legal drugs such as cannabis must be aware of any potential effects. someone is impaired, is acting impaired mm -hmm. at work and gets sent for a cannabis test, right. then saying, oh, it was medically prescribed isn't an adequate defense mm -hmm. because they were impaired on the job. Okay, so it's the impairment. It's the it's impairment that, that triggers the whole thing. Because we can use, uh, we cannot, we cannot mandate that they not use marijuana, but we can, as an employer, say that you cannot be impaired on the job. Mm -hmm. How did you feel just about policy? Um, you mean about this? Well, well, the, well, because I would say my general feeling. First of all, I, I'm I'm fine with it. Yeah. I'm, and, and I, you know, yeah. The um, I thought it was maybe slightly more kind of like rigid than like if I were like in charge that I would I would want it to maybe be a little bit more flexible. That was I my only I mean again it's 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 policy for the library that I, and I'm kind of thinking about it from my own perspective that I would I personally would want it to be maybe a little bit more give me well, more flexibility as you know if I were in charge. Well, and the flexibility actually comes in in the reasonable suspicion of impairment procedure and how we apply that and how the people who actually are acting as person in charge of the library um, handle any complaint or anything, any incident that they see in the library. That's where it really gives them some, some flexibility to do, we have a reasonable suspicion checklist that um, is behavioral based, mm -hmm. um, where they observe the employee who is, they suspect, is impaired. And you go through the checklist and you can move on from that point or not. Mm -hmm. And the next step is an interview of that employee. And it actually, the procedure has two um, supervisory or in charge level um, employees actually completing that independently and then deciding together whether this person should go for testing or not. Um, so it's not one person making the judgment call by themselves. Um, it, it's two
two people applying a, a pretty detailed checklist. Additional questions or comments? Do we have any? Reasonable suspicion is the words that I hear all the time in these conversations. Exactly. That's broad, and then it's great to hear all the checklists. And that's actually Jen and I have been working on that reasonable, <laughs> reasonable suspicion of impairment procedure. We've gone back and forth on how detailed that yeah, should very be. Detailed it was, and first it was really <laughs> short, then it was really long. Now it's like, I think we've uh, <laughs> happy medium. Now. It's kind of like you know, you, if you see it, you kind of know it. Like yeah, situation. Exactly. Um, it's hard to kind of it's define like, it. Yeah. The checklist helps to know what's a little yeah. more. What about getting um, some of the global police force and how they determine like whether someone is impaired? Like the testing that they do. We, 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 not, we have not walked straight, straight line down yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Um, we come in uh, here and. Yeah. <laughs> right. We have gone with, the, with um, management association and, and the HR professionals. You know, this is how you deal with the employees. Oh, okay. yeah. I think the tricky thing with law enforcement is that they're also doing a lot of multiple issues, so the employer wouldn't necessarily have to deal with the same way. You know, that's kind of leading out of the health and the part of it. And for the uh, testing, if it were to get to that, you would be not doing that in house, but outsource. Oh, um, oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. uh, the sure, company the that does, yeah, the company that does our um, our background checks also does the drug testing. Oh, and so, okay, yes, you guys. Have and so we're just going you. with the whole alcohol and drug panel and. Do you know if it's here at this point? I believe it's both, but I'm not sure, and they won't talk to us much about it until we have a policy. Right. Okay. Okay. And I forget which one. Yeah. Five, five, five. Yeah. Well, and currently there isn't a really good test for cannabis because it stays in the system for longer, and there are a number of um, different tests under development uh, to test saliva in particular for more immediate kinds of results, but that has not yet been released to the general public. So. Okay. Any other questions or comments regarding the personnel policy update? I'm sorry, one more question. It says MRO, Medical Review Officer. Yes. So to have their split specimen sent to federally certified lab. Um, that is a procedure on the um, testing company's side. They assign a medical review officer, and when someone gives a sample, it is actually split and they test part of it and they uh -huh. save part of it. And then if you need a follow-up test, that's uh -huh. the split specimen. Questions? And if not, do we have a motion to approve the personnel policy, preferably with my up proposed updates? I will move to update to approve the personnel policy with your updates. Thank you. Do we have a second? Okay. We have a motion to approve agenda item 8B personnel policy uh, 3.40 alcohol and drug free workplace, incorporating. Um, the revisions that we discussed um, that has been seconded. So all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Okay, agenda item 8C has been approved. Thank you very much. We're now on to agenda item <coughs> uh, 8C, art donation by the Downers Grove Public Library Foundation. Once again, we have Art Committee Chair Robin Triloff from the Downers Grove Public <coughs> Library Foundation here to talk about donating some more art to the library. Well, yes. I'm pleased to be here again. 
Uh, thank you for the last piece that you approved, and you all have a flyer in front of you for the unveiling, so I hope you can come to one of both. Very excited about that. Um, tonight, I have another piece. I'm not going to read all this to you because I know it's in your packets, so in the interest of time, um, I just want to say we'll, that we're delighted to present these two works of art that we recommend that we purchase and donate to you. Uh, should you, in fact, vote in favor of accepting these two donations, um, we're really pleased that these two, plus the one already approved that's being unveiled next month, really broaden the public's art experience of the library, and that's something the Foundation wants to see us do. So these artists and these works of art really are broadening that, and I hope that you will accept the proposal tonight. Are there any questions? Do you know, um like what the kind of meaning behind the Rumi session series is? I don't like, know the exact quote okay. from Rumi, no. Okay, no, just it's, I find, I thought this was very interesting because it looks like there's like this, like there's all these words and like information on one side, it's being sort of blocked with this red like bar and it's being like pulled. I just thought it was a very, I thought it was a great choice, so. We've had a lot of positive feedback. Yeah. Yes. And this was during a period of time when this artist was very interested in Remy's works. And uh, that was a nice adjunct piece. First, we like it as a work of art. And that's very important for you to understand. But secondarily, because this is a literary artist and in the library, that makes it even more fitting. Can you tell me a little bit about whether this artist has a connection to area of Downers Grove, the region, or why else, how this artist kind of surface for the, for the foundation, and what drew you to um, that? The artist surfaced as part of the search I did a year ago, when I was looking for artists that we wanted to invite to submit works of art. Um, I found 21 artists in the Chicago area, we didn't limit ourselves to Downers Grove, um, and we looked at those 21 artists, we narrowed that down to seven artists, um, in the first round, we were not quite ready to make a choice, so we went into another round, and Melissa Leandro, the piece that's being unveiled, and Sarva were the two that really came out on top. And one of the reasons that her art was not selected for the big <laughs> wall in the lobby is um, the scale of the pieces. They're smaller, and she had put forth, <coughs> actually, she put forth these pieces as possible for that wall, the foundation directors felt very strongly that they liked her work and wanted to include it in the collection, mm -hmm. but that it wasn't right for that location. The scale is just not right. But in, and you also have the locations here listed where it will go, and those will feature the work and it will stand out and have, it will have the right amount of space around it. Um, to do justice for each piece, whereas it kind of would have been swimming lost in space in what I call the big wall. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Robin. Mm -hmm. So, do we have any initial thoughts? I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of the art, and I think it would be a great addition to the library. And I appreciate you continuing you know, with the search and continuing to bring really good artwork uh, to the board. Any other? I do, my favorite is the second one, though. <laughs> you know, it's funny. My favorite one is the first one, but <laughs> I, I'm kind of the Lone Ranger. I think everyone's first yeah. choice is the second one. But because I was just reading, she's from Iran, it looks like, and so you have, I do feel like it's like this one. Put, like push and pull between like the information and the you know knowledge on one side is being kind of pulled yes. out of the way. So, so I apologize because I don't maybe look around the library and see if we put a little detail about the artist. We don't now, but that's something that I have in the works to change. So um, it might drive people to get a book about the different artists. Like that. Right, or in the case of Sarvin's work, uh, also works by Rumi, which are in the library collection. I don't know if anyone here has been to the Hinsdale Library, but at each work of art in their collection, they have a card 
bunch of them free to the public to take with reproduction of the work of art and then on the back information about the artist and the piece. And so that's what I have in the works for both Melissa's piece mm -hmm. and both of these pieces. And we have the same. That's this is how the card is actually? Yeah, that's, oh, I picture that's like a little business card. card. That's, that's from the from the human I like that a lot. <laughs> so they say opening <laughs> doors. <laughs> What is the, and, and I just, I would have to walk around and try to figure out where, you know, the placement, but I'm just wondering with her work being kind of above the photocopier, like what, I mean, well, whether there might be a better place at some point. We actually, um, she came here okay. and met with us and we walked to the library and so these locations were all jointly selected okay. with her. Um, the piece you see on the wall now won't be there and the furniture will be removed and her piece will be centered. Okay. Uh, pardon me, not removed, moved, okay. re reorganized, pardon yeah. me, I shouldn't have said that. Um, and her piece will be centered with the space around it, and for example, the lower level table will be in the middle, and that's all that will be under it, so it will very much have a place of prominence. Okay. Good. I think the artist would also like part of when you're at, you know, talking to them and telling them about the cards would be of interest to them. Yes, well, um, Melissa has written the information that will be on the back of her card, and then should you approve the Sarvin works, you'll have her own as well. Okay, do we have any additional questions regarding the acceptance of the art donation, donations at the Gen Item BC? Do we have a motion to approve Art donations. I will move to approve the art donations. Okay, we have a motion to approve the art donations set forth in agenda item 8C um, that has been made by the Downers Grove Public Library Foundation. And let's go with the roll call on this one. Okay. Trustee Dorn. Yes. Trustee McGowan. Yes. Trustee Kutika. Yes. Trustee Siegel. Yes. Leslie Graver. Yes. Thank you very much. We have approved the art donation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're now on to agenda item number nine, unfinished business. We don't think have we have any. any. Okay. And then we're now on to agenda item number 10, the library director's report. And the first thing we're going to do is hand this off to <laughs> building operations manager <laughs> Ian Moore to talk about <coughs> what's happening in the facilities department and trends and inspiration. Yes, yeah, so um, so first and foremost, uh, with facilities, it's all about building functionality, serving the community, meeting the needs and expectations of the community as a facility. Uh, so my biggest thing um, in facilities, main, main goal is you know make sure the building operates as intended every day without interruptions to service. Uh, whether this be heating and cooling, HVAC, depending on what season, uh, making sure lighting is functional, Washrooms are in service and meet expectations. Uh, part of the way we meet that criteria is uh, we have a new cleaning company that we just brought on board as of January 1st, and we've also implemented new cleaning practices. Um, there's more scheduled services, uh, such as deep cleans of the tile and the grout in all the public washrooms, um, so that everything listens and is bright. That actually happens twice a month uh, through uh, Syntax services. Um, Stripping and waxing of hard surface floors, whether it be the florazo that's up in the north entrance or up in the main stairwell, um, or even back in the workrooms, just trying to, to, to prolong the life of the material and keep everything um, on its maintenance schedule so that way we can get the most longevity out of it as possible. Um, you know, doing little things like this help the public notice, you know, it's a clean building, it's a healthy building. Um, upkeep of grounds is a big thing. John Martin is still on on retainer, he is our he's our he's our go-to landscaper now. Um, uh, he does primarily most of his work in spring, summer, and fall. So, 
Um, plus, we're still in. Uh, we're still working with the Green Grovers at Dodge Grove. Um, I know that they have some gardening ideas coming up for the spring, um, and I venture to guess I'll be meeting with Sue Farley and Mary Jo um, pretty pretty close to February or mid February because they're going to be getting ready for the thaw. So, um, creating the welcoming facility provide, uh, provides positive patient interactions and experiences. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's. The, the building speaks for itself. People are happy to come in. Um, you know, they feel comfortable. It's almost like a second home, and that then goes ahead and trickles down in how they interact with staff. So, at least from my my point of view, it does. So, um, along with that, uh, you know, work requests, furniture assembly, um, everyday repairs, the stuff that you know that that, that needs to get done, um, we take care of all of that. Um, and then there's the preventive maintenance and predictive maintenance side. Um, so preventive maintenance schedules, you know, I set a preventive maintenance schedule depending on manufacturer's recommendations. Um, so depending on what piece of equipment it is, um, you know, I'll, I'll get with our, our vendors that we use for whatever outfit, you know, whether it be HVAC, plumbers, depending on the piece of equipment. Um, and from meeting with them and getting their field practices and then also going back to manufacturer suggestions, we're able to come up with a preventive maintenance schedule. Um, we do have to hire out for some things because you, you don't want me cleaning a, a heat exchanger on, on a brand new boiler that's still covered under the warranty. You want to have the professionals do that. But when it comes to the decreasing pumps, change out couplings, fan motors, stuff like that, we take care of a lot of that in-house. Um, Predictive maintenance is a little bit different. So when I'm coming up with a predictive maintenance schedule, I'm taking into consideration manufacturer's date, when, when the piece of equipment was built, when it was put into service, where it comes on the service records. Do I have a long history of repairs on this piece of equipment? Um, what, what is the end of life on it? You know, if we're talking about a boiler, we're good for about 20 to 25 years. You know, anything past that, you're going to be lucky if they're even making parts for the thing anymore. So those are things that we have to take into consideration. And so when we come and, and ask for approval for big projects and stuff like this, it's all due to we, we're projecting the end of life for this piece of equipment that if we don't take care of it within a certain time frame, actually could hinder and shut us down for a longer period of time. Um, Myself, I do daily maintenance schedules, and those are digitally kept on file, and those actually get distributed to Julie and Jen every day. Uh, I use a program called LogCheck, so not only am I visually uh, making inspections on all the equipment, the roof, pretty much everything, but I'm also logging it in, and I'm watching trends on if I have downtime on equipment, or if there's something wrong with a piece of equipment or if something needs to be repaired, I'm able to track all that and I do share all that information via a spreadsheet with them. They get, they get that shot to them daily. So, um, building improvements. So, making the value of the library uh, being visible. Uh, we achieve this through visual upgrades of the facility, uh, cost efficiency using direct label, or, uh, I'm sorry, labor and multiple vendors. Um, so we briefly touched base on the LED lighting conversion. So as we stand now, I, between myself and the outside work that we've had done, we're 90% converted. The other 10% that we have are uh, T5 fluorescent lights. Um, and right now, the T5 fluorescents are more cost effective than the LED version. It's just that the T5 LEDs, the real thin ones, we've got the pendant lights that are hanging down in the kids' room and up on the magazine areas. Um, the cost on those LEDs is just, it's way too high up right now to justify changing all those over. But as we get further on into the year and technology becomes greater and more people start manufacturing them, that price will come down. That's when we'll finish off that conversion and it'll be completely all LED. Um, hopefully by this year. So I am watching prices and everything else and seeing what other manufacturers are making them, but so far it's only the big three. So. And then who, who would that be? Uh, you got GE, Phillips, and Sylvania. Okay. Yeah. So like PLT, PLT and some of these other uh, other companies um, aren't, aren't doing it yet because they're waiting for all the big guys to, to work out all the kinks and then they're going to go ahead and steal their stuff and, okay. and, and mass produce it. So. 90% is great. 
What's that? 90%. Yeah, 90% is a lot better than when I first came, you know, two years ago. Um, so as Julie kind of addressed, you know, we, we did have some changes. We did some things a lot earlier than we had planned just because we were able to. Um, kids room, I like to use that one as an example because at a completion year of 2021 and a, and a budget of $383,000 to completely do the kids room, that also means the STEM room. Um, and we did it in-house and reduced it to 8,500. So brand new lighting throughout the kids' room, and, and we saved a lot of money on that one. Um, I, need, I need an Ian at home. Ian yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. did the wood itself and work overnight on that project. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. yeah, we saved a lot of money on Ian's hard work. So, so um, energy efficiency is really big for, for us. Um, you know, we've got the brand new HVAC plant, which is very energy efficient. Um, I'm pretty astonished at how well we can heat the building and how little I have to run those boilers. Um, so we're doing that to obviously help reduce the carbon footprint on the environment. Um, but we're also doing it to save money. Again, this is another project that um, we came in well under. Um, as Julie talked about, um, the, the figures that they gave me at first um, did change because the comment rebate we're still waiting on that. I'm, I'm forecasting to see around 60 to 65 um, thousand for to come under budget on that one. So it, it could go up even higher, but I won't know until I get the final check cut from comment. So, uh, so also facility safety and security. Um, we started to ensure uh, patrons and staff have a safe environment to visit and also work in. And one of the way, uh, some of the ways we achieve this is through technology and proactive facility staff. Um, we do use video, video monitoring on site, um, patron, patron interaction tracking software, so uh, we are able to, to go back to earlier events, see if there's any pictures attached, see if there's a trend um, on any situations that may occur in the library. Um, regular security patrols of the interior and exterior of the facility, and then also situational awareness. Um, safety and security team was formed in 2019 in an effort to stay up to date with security trends as they change and provide ongoing training for staff. Um, and one of the ways we do that is by working with the Donna Grove Fire Department and Police Department. Um, we've had them both come in on our uh, in-service days. Um, I've also worked with uh, Wally, who happens to be my contact for the fire department in scheduling uh, drills, good practices, and then Bill Buds, who's my contact, who I also check with um, to see if there's anything new that's coming down um, as far as you know, situation awareness, active intruder, type of situation like that, just so we can stay one step ahead. Um, and then we all bring that to staff. So, so the big thing is, uh, where are the trends for the future, and where are we looking to go to you know, after we get all the LED lights done and you know, we've got a brand new heating plant and, and a new roof after 2022 and everything else. Um, so some of the things, we know that we've got the 2020 SEER renovations, so masonry, tuck pointing, cleaning, uh, brick replacement, exterior painting, caulking, tree trimming around the building. It's, the whole exterior is pretty much going to look brand new by the time it's all set and done. Um, 2021, we're looking at the roof replacement of the rubber membrane. That'd be awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> serving of usable space is a big thing that I'm looking into. Um, how we can better utilize areas, um, whether it be furniture for that area, partial walls, sound deadening. Um, so that is something I'm looking into. Um, I got things here in my head that I'm that I'm trying to look at, see what we can do for maker space and stuff like that. Um, so those are some things I'm looking into. And then the big one that is really early in its fruition, uh, but I am working with a solar energy company um, to see what it would take to pull us at least halfway off of ComEd's grid by using renewable solar power. Um, that's something that's going to be pretty far out. It's, we definitely wouldn't want to do it before we do the roof in 2022. Um, but I am constantly looking for grants through the federal government and also through state grants. And I'm working with Fitzgerald Electric 
uh, to see if we can come up with a partnership. There was talk about them actually financing the project, but we're still working on how that's going to happen. So it's very early, but we are looking into it, and I will keep you posted on how that goes. Spring, I'm going to have a couple of solar solar uh, companies out here. We're gonna, we've got the good footprint for it on the roof because we've got nothing obstructing the view. So it's just a matter of making it work, how heavy is it going to be, and how much can we really pull off of the grid and, and sustain. So. Are there any um, improvements that are kind of not on our, our on our list that you think maybe should be there? I can answer that. Ian and I are talking about it. It's not. It's not. It's the well, man. Yeah. The the elevator. Yeah. The elevator is not included in the capital needs um, assessment, and it probably should have been. And yeah, it definitely should have been. It's it's end of use was. About two years ago, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but we do we do constantly keep maintenance up on it. Um, luckily, it is a hydraulic car. Um, hydraulic cars are a bit more forgiving than a cable car, um, and plus the fact that it's only a two stop, so we've only got two floors and it's got to go up and down, um, makes it a lot easier. So um, I have already last year. I just for grins, pulled some numbers to see what it'd be for an elevator mod job. It actually wasn't as terrible um, as I thought it would be because it's just a single car, but the big kicker is it's gonna be down for a period of time. Um, they pretty much rebuild the whole entire car. They change out the motor, the components, everything. Um, so there's definitely something that we're gonna want to uh, to, 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 to get, a, get an eye on and maybe since we did the, the Big lighting project in 2021, we can, or that was due in 2021, we can maybe shift that elevator mod in there. How much downtime? It'll be weeks. weeks. It'll be weeks. <laughs> Which will make it hard, but that's the hard because mm -hmm. yeah, because you're gonna have guys in the in the, in the elevator shaft yeah. and you know they rip them out, you know they pretty much take all the guts out and then replace that whole thing. What? And this is like I know nothing about elevators. Other yeah. Than, is it possible just to like have a new elevator in a different location? Ooh. Possible. Yes. Oh, man, possible. possible. Yes. Seriously, Seriously expensive. expensive. Yes. Okay. Actually, um, relocation and a completely new elevator was originally part of the 2014 renovation when they first drew it up, and it was taken out. Of the car. Okay. I'm just thinking that that eliminates the downtime. And when I think of like ripping out the pieces of the current elevator, I just think of like other things happening that are unexpected or it takes twice as long as we think it's going to take. And I've done I've done about four elevator mod jobs, and they actually don't go as bad as you think they do. Yeah. Um, it's. Pretty much what's, they, they upgrade all the interior of the car. Um, so new control panel, new lighting, everything gets upgraded in that. So aesthetically, um, you know, you can see it's all upgraded. Uh, the meat of it is in the, the motor room. Um, so the, the hydraulic tank, that motor, everything comes out of there. And that's the most time consuming thing is just reconnecting all of that to the new car. Um, so it's not it's not as bad. Like I said, the worst thing is the downtime. And since we only have one car here, that that's going to be the big impact. Um, so it would have to be something that you know. Do we theoretically, it's something that we could have the architects look at and you know draw something up, especially since we have the same architects have worked with us. Um, since prior to the 2014 renovation, we could take a look at it and see what it would possibly cost. But it's probably going to be glass where you look outside. Or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, numbers will fluctuate, but it, but it, from the numbers that I got from Urban Elevator last year, it was about seventy-five thousand for a remodel. And what would it, what do you remember what the cost was just for a new one? Building the hoist way. Oh, you, a it's like a, it's, yes, it's, yeah, it's basically it's, a, you're adding on to the existing library. Mm -hmm. and 
So yeah, there, and, and there would be reconfiguration within the library the building, to accommodate yeah. you know, so it would be. You and you're not, you don't have enough room to do a cable car here, so you'd have to do a hydraulic. Um, so then you're, you've got to drill to get that giant piston down into the ground. And then you got to make another pit. Yeah, you got to make another pit, and then you're really taking out a huge section of the library. I believe it was the Empire State Builder or something. Like you get in the elevator, the lights go off, and then these LED lights start going. It's oh, I know. Cool. No, 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 no. <laughs> but then you're going to have kids like using your elevator all the time. <laughs> Be talked about on social media. <laughs> <laughs> library has new elevator. We, we can see if we can do something like that. <laughs> they put that one on the list. Yeah, <laughs> put that on the list. <laughs> I'm just here for good. Yeah, so sure it's Ian retro. Definitely something we're going to keep an eye on. Yes, it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> parts for the car that we have, you can get them still. They're, just, they're not something that people carry on the shelves anymore, so it's all special order stuff. Um, so we've got a little bit of time. And like I said, we, we do keep, we do regular upkeep on it. In fact, he was just out today. Um, you know, nothing alarming or anything that we need to do right now, so. Um, given your exploration of solar panels and things like that, yes. would that change, potentially change the specification and project for the roof, the re-roof? Well, see, that's what we would want to do. We want to hold off on doing anything solar until after the re-roof. Right, but it wouldn't change, like, the Oh, as far as like the mill on like the rubber membrane? No, nothing like that. So I actually went out and um, met with the facility manager at uh, Indian Trails. Um, and I went and I checked them out. Um, and I got the whole, I got pictures and everything. I can share an email later if you want. But uh, so it's, it's initially a skid that it's, it's a metal frame that they all, they all link together and they all nest. Um, and then they just, hooked to this metal frame and then they run the power lines down to the batteries and then the batteries connect to the ComEd panel. Um, and so initially when you when you use up all of the solar energy, you go back on ComEd. Um, so like even even Indian trails, they can't get a hundred. They've got six. No, we could have more and sell it. That's what I was thinking too. This is the big size. This is the big size. <laughs> so <laughs> that, the only thing is we 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 want to we want to make sure that you know structurally we don't have to, um, you know, make any changes to the roof system or anything like that. Um, so there's there's a lot of factors that come into it, but definitely we it wouldn't change anything on what we have to do for the re-roof. Um, this is it, it's nothing that would, we're, like I said, we're not looking to completely get off the grid. Um, even to get off like 50% on combat, we're only looking at like 40 or 50 panels. So. Um, because in order for us to get off the grid, we would need to generate two, that I think that did the calcs, and it was almost 2,200 uh, kilowatt hours of energy, um, and it would take three panels running, three panels absorbing for eight hours to just get like five kilowatt <laughs> So like literally, if we want to get off combat, we'd have to do the entire roof like in one giant solar panel. <laughs> but that's not gonna happen. So, but even if we get half it off, it'll, when you're doing some of that research and talking to the different companies, I would suggest some programming around solar panels, and solar energy too. Just I think a lot of Downers Grove residents are interested in it. Oh sure. And could use that education. Yeah, and I, as far as I know, and I, when I looked it up, um, no, I don't think anybody in downtown district businesses are utilizing solar energy. But you said Indian Trail. Indian Trails, yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. yep, they uh, they do solar in their their whole HVAC plant is geothermal. Mm -hmm. yeah, they did a recent remodel and it's uh, lead certified. They also got a very large grant from uh, EBSCO to help offset that cost too. So. Well, you need to start working on that too. I <laughs> will I'm looking to see if I can get it. <laughs> So no, don't no, tell no, like I said we're very early into it. I'm meeting up with some outfits in the spring, and I'll have, I'll get more information to you. Okay. Uh, but we're not looking anything to not within this year. Okay. So. Does it change our insurance requirements in terms of like you know severe weather? It seems like there'd be more opportunities for damaging things if there's solar panels on the Yeah, I have not looked into that yet. Yeah. As far as I know, the Lira policy does not take into account whether or not you have solar panels as a 
matter of fact, I believe Indian Trails is one of our fellow Lira members. And as far as I know, there is no special provision for that. Oh, is this a library, Indian Trails? Yes, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yeah. Indian Trails yeah. Public yeah. Library. Yeah. Okay, oh, sorry. Got it. No Indian Trails Public sorry. Library District. And ours is called Indian Trail, when you start to say okay. trails. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Sir. And then, uh, let's see. I have a couple of addenda to the written um, library's report that you have. Uh, first and foremost is letting you all know that in February, immediately before and or immediately after the meeting, our own Ed Bromiel will be taking your pictures in up in the <laughs> Media Lab or I, where you're going to set up here. I don't know. Anyway, we'll let you know um, we're doing new headshots. For everyone, the entire management team has already done their headshots. We're doing new headshots for all of the staff, for the staff pictures. So, to be consistent. What if we don't like our new headshot? <laughs> you, can, you can take that up with Ed and Max and the IT department who are in charge of all Do we have, um, do we have like hair and makeup before the <laughs> headshot? <laughs> Well, uh, when we did for the management team, uh, our public relations manager, uh, Sadiq Tree, and the uh, computer help desk supervisor, Lauren Cantori, were the um, consulting uh, hair and makeup folk <laughs> <laughs> on the, in the headshot room, making sure that everybody looked just so. And Cindy will be coming to do her department update in February, so she will be on hand. Okay. Those. And if you missed that board meeting, because I think there's a chance I missed February. Oh, no, then we'll have to just schedule a time for you to come. Oh, this is your DMV picture. <laughs> 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 I missed February. Oh, so no, I, I don't know. Warm, hot, and then I don't know. Oh, yeah, we'll have to. As long as if it's just the two of you, then the other four can have a meeting, but one more down, and we're not having a meeting. Um, and then also, we want to congratulate Caitlin Babalitis on her 15 years of service anniversary. <laughs> Caitlin was approximately 12 when she said. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yes. um, also, you each have your brand new uh, Serving Our Public Standards for Illinois Public Libraries. Um, and you also have this little goodie, this okay, little so card so that's the digital Ooh. copy. Oh, it's very fancy. Anyway, so you can put this in your wallet and take the Illinois Public Library standards with you wherever you <laughs> 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 On a somber note, I would like to acknowledge uh, the passing of Thomas Reed, a former trustee of the Delbridge Grove Public Library, who served from uh, 2003 to 2016. Um, Tom Reed was an amazing man. Just He was instrumental in the revitalization of our Delbridge Grove Library Foundation as well um, before he moved relocated to Texas a couple of years ago, so um, Tom will be greatly missed by all of his family and friends. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, the Downers Grove Library Foundation. We will have our first major fundraiser from the foundation on Saturday, February 22nd. There, uh, go to dgplf.org forward slash tickets to find uh, tickets to that event. Um, that is from three to five at Caden's Kitchen. It's $50 a person. There is a service fee along the way. Um, and it will be a Meet the Artist with Melissa Leandro uh, for our new lobby artwork. The following day, Sunday, uh, February 23rd, at 3 p.m., we will be doing the unveiling of the work, and that is an open and free public event. Thank you very much. Um, we're now on to agenda item number 11, trustee comments and requests for information. Do you have any trustee comments or requests for information? Well, there is a grant. Oh, the application is in your packet. 
Um, that is that is funded through um, the state of Illinois. It is a maximum of $1.25 per capita. The equalization portion is based on need. We will not qualify for that. Um, in the recent years, they have had it uh, fully funded at $1.25 per capita. Um, so it is Yes. Okay, any additional comments or requests for information? All right, we're on to agenda item number 12, and I hereby adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>